Take a look at this square. Inside are thousands of tiny bugs we call microbes or microbiota. But unless you're born a microscope, you probably can't see them. So let me just show you. I'm of course talking about the bacteria, viruses and other microbes living on your screen. These microbes are everywhere, on your floor, your clothes, your hands and all over your body. In fact, right now, there are actually trillions of microbes living on your skin and inside of you. About 95% of them are in your gut, constantly being turned over, living or dying mostly based on what you eat and drink. We call this the gut microbiome. And here's where it gets interesting, because these tiny bugs kind of give you special abilities. Some of them speed up your metabolism, some of them fight sickness and disease, but probably most fascinating of all is how some microbes affect your brain. They can make you happier, more energized, more motivated, less stressed, less anxious. I can keep going, but the point is, these microbes can literally change who you are, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. And for many of us, it's getting worse. All the highly processed junk food, the sugary snacks, the alcohol, the painkillers, they're all feeding microbes that damage your gut, which in turn damage your brain. This is what's called the gut-brain connection, because what happens in the gut also affects the brain. But maybe more amazing is what happens in the brain also affects the gut. That bad feeling you get in your stomach when you're stressed or anxious, that is no coincidence. That's the gut-brain connection, and it's probably affecting you more often than you realize. So, let me show you how these microorganisms have been living with you since birth, how the way you feel, think and behave is directly connected to the food you eat, but most importantly, what you can do to build a healthy gut microbiome. Okay, let's go. So what exactly is your gut? Some people think it's just your stomach, but it's actually a system of multiple organs that digest your food. That's why it's also called the digestive tract or GI tract. You can think of it as a long tube that runs through the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small and large intestine, rectum and anus. And all along this tube, but mostly in the large intestine, are the trillions of microorganisms that together weigh just a little more than your brain. Basically, your gut provides a microenvironment or microbiome that houses the nutrients, warmth, acidity and other factors that allow different microbes to thrive. These microbes are mostly made up of different types of bacteria, but also include viruses, fungi, archaea and other microorganisms. But where exactly do they all come from? Well, it starts the moment you're born. If you deliver naturally, microbes from your mother's vagina and feces wash over you and are the initial inhabitants of your microbiome. And because vaginal and fecal microbes are similar to gut microbes, you're exposed to a broad range of microbiota that thrive in your gut. This helps to develop a strong immune system, a healthy metabolism and better brain function. If you're delivered via C-section, however, your microbiome gets colonized by your mother's skin microbes, which are much less diverse and meant to protect and maintain skin, not the gut. Which is why studies continue to show that if you are delivered via C-section, then there's a high chance your immune system, metabolism and overall brain function will suffer, putting you at a higher risk for things like asthma, autism, obesity, ADHD and a lot more. So what exactly is causing all these disorders? Well, without going into too much detail, think of these microbiota as bugs with different abilities that help protect your brain and body. Some of them allow you to metabolize certain foods, some give you more energy, focus and attention, some improve your memory and learning, and some just plain old fight other microbes to protect you. I can keep going, but the main thing to understand is that this is why you want to gather as many different beneficial microbes or abilities that you can to protect, repair and balance your gut. And if you're wondering how this is possible for anyone delivered via C-section, well, luckily for them, birth is only the first stage of colonizing your microbiome. It's actually the two to three years after that are critical in determining the full range of microbiota that can live in your body, where different aspects of life determine the potential of your microbial diversity. Things like who handles you after birth, how many people you come in contact with, whether you have pets, whether you play in the dirt, whether you're breastfed, probably not till that age though, and of course, whatever else you eat and drink. The idea is to not worry too much about cleanliness, but to still be wary of infections and deadly diseases. By the time you reach age two or three, your microbiome stabilizes and is more similar to an adult. This is when your gut bacteria becomes more resilient to change, though not impossible. The main difference is that after this point, your microbiome only really changes based on what you consume, your level of stress, how well you sleep and how much you exercise. And I'm gonna tell you exactly how they're all connected and how they lead to a healthy gut. But first, I need to tell you about the gut-brain connection. 
The gut-brain connection refers to the two-way link that allows the gut to talk to the brain and the other way round. This is thanks to the neurons in the gut that receive info on what's happening inside and then communicate that to the brain. Well, these neurons get particularly activated when they sense certain nutrients, fats, proteins and sugars. They really like sugars, so let's say you eat something sugary for example. Well, as you break down the food, these neurons sense sugar in the gut, triggering them to send signals to your brain that cause the release of dopamine, a neuromodulator I covered in my last video. But if you don't know what dopamine is, it's basically a chemical that rewards you with feelings of pleasure after doing something, which makes you want to do it again. So in this case, you eat more sugary foods. Of course, none of that's really news to anyone. We've all done plenty of thinking with our stomachs, but this is just one way that the gut talks to the brain. What's not as well known, but way more interesting, is the role that these microbes play in the gut-brain connection. I am inside your head. Remember how I told you they have abilities? Well, those abilities can literally change your behavior and your personality. Let me explain. The bacillus and serratia bacteria have the ability to create dopamine. What this means is an increase in your baseline level of dopamine, which means you're generally more motivated, so you're more driven to do anything. The same goes for your levels of norepinephrine, responsible for energy and focus, or acetylcholine, responsible for learning and memory. There are bacteria in your gut that produce all of these chemicals and more. In fact, over 90% of all your serotonin, the feel-good chemical that makes you calm and happy, is produced in your gut. And if you don't have enough of this particular microbe or any other microbes that produce other chemicals, then your baseline for each will be lower and you'll naturally feel less happy or less energetic or less focused or less whatever. You get the point. So how do you get more of these good microbes? Well, let's start with how you don't get more of them. How they die. As you can imagine, the trillions of microbiota in your gut all have different conditions that allow them to thrive or die. And so just like any other ecosystem, they compete with each other to survive. Some compete for the same food, some compete for the same space, and some just straight up murder other microbiota. That's how we invented antibiotics, drugs that kill bacteria. They're made from microbes that specialize in bacterial genocide. That's why when you do a round of antibiotics, you're not just killing the bad bacteria, you're wiping out all the good bacteria too. So try to keep this as minimal as possible. And while we're on the subject of medication, I should probably mention that anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin and ibuprofen also indirectly kill the good bacteria in your gut. It's actually quite ironic and ridiculous to be honest, because these anti-inflammatories end up causing dysbiosis, an imbalance in the microbiome that promotes the growth of bad bacteria and the death of good bacteria, which only leads to more inflammation. Exactly what these drugs are trying to prevent. Inflammation isn't exactly a bad thing, it's an immune response that helps kill invasive microbes and repair your cells. But when there's too much of it for too long, it ends up causing damage all over your body instead. And so when the gut gets overwhelmed with inflammation, it tears down the walls that were safely containing all the bacteria, viruses and other microbes, which allows them to leak into the bloodstream and up to the brain where they cause infection. This is a condition called leaky gut syndrome, and has been linked to a long list of diseases and issues like arthritis, lupus, diabetes, eczema, asthma, food allergies, other allergies, and a whole bunch of autoimmune diseases. Of course, nothing contributes more to leaky gut syndrome and the death of good microbes than your diet. The microbiota in your gut live and die by the food you eat. Different foods feed different microbes, and if a microbe isn't being fed, it dies or becomes inactive. As always, foods that are highly processed, high in unhealthy fats and sugars, and low in dietary fiber are enemy number one to you and your microbiome. They feed the bad bacteria and build an environment that kills the good bacteria, often causing dysbiosis, inflammation, and leaky gut. This doesn't mean you can't eat any of these foods, you just really don't want to do it too often. What you should be eating instead is probiotics and prebiotics. Probiotics are live bacteria that are beneficial to your gut. They literally mean good bacteria and are found in fermented foods like kimchi and sauerkraut. There's more, but you can Google that yourself. Studies show clearly that the best way to increase microbial diversity is by having a diet rich in fermented foods. I suggest starting with a few servings a week to get your gut used to it first, and then move up to at least one serving a day, varying the types of fermented foods for maximum diversity. Prebiotics is just fiber, and it's the preferred food of good bacteria. So that includes vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, grains, and whatever other fibrous whole foods you can find. Try to eat at least one serving with every meal, the more the better, because these prebiotics also produce something called short-chain fatty acids, which do things like help strengthen the walls of your gut, improve metabolism, and reduce inflammation. So by mainly eating a range of fibrous and fermented foods, you should be able to repair and maintain a healthy gut. Unless, of course, you're extremely stressed. 
because what we know is that chronic stress can also cause dysbiosis through the gut-brain connection. This is because stress releases cortisol, the stress hormone, which has antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory abilities as well as reduces the production of short-chain fatty acids. That's pretty much everything that isn't good for your microbiome, which is why you want to keep stress to a minimum. And that's why the other building blocks of a healthy gut microbiome are sleep and exercise, which both regulate stress and levels of cortisol. If you don't get enough sleep and exercise, you end up with more cortisol in your system, which is why if you've ever been sleep deprived or if you sit around most of the day, you generally feel more anxious and stressed. Not only that, but sleep and exercise also increase those short-chain fatty acids I was talking about before, which further decreases cortisol and improves sleep. So you can start to see how this is really all connected. If you barely exercise, you generally feel more stressed, which can lead to poor sleep, leading to poor food choices, then to even more stress and less sleep, all the while slowly killing the good bacteria and moving towards leaky gut syndrome and everything that comes with it. So instead, eat as many different fibrous and fermented foods as possible, exercise daily, and get your seven to eight hours of sleep every night. 